Today is our last session and we're going to talk about the disability of molecular simulations and now uh, why I'm talking about. Um, I first plan to make it really maybe simple and uh, keep it in very abstract terms, but then due to our discussions in the last day and a half, I decided to change it a little bit and maybe make it a little bit more personal and maybe make it a little bit more real um, in, in that case. So, I'll start with you words. So I'm currently unemployed and unaffiliated. Mm -hmm. So you must wonder, like, what am I doing here, actually? Mm -hmm. And the reason is because before I got unemployed and unaffiliated, I started working on MDBox, which is a cloud-based repository for molecular dynamic simulations and analysis. It's actually also something along the lines of the idea what Chris was talking about yesterday, like bring compute to data, uh, so you don't have to like uh, move it from one computer to the next. You can analyze it in the cloud. Hopefully, one day you can also run the simulations, automate as much as workflow as possible for reproducibility. You can always check all the input parameters. Uh, and so on and so, so forth. So I stole this slide from my uh, previous presentation about the box. So the idea was to provide storage to the researchers and also a toolbox. So you can also do all sorts of things. And the idea for storage was that as we all move between different institutions, then we also lose access to the data once we lose our credentials. So accessing data on some other uh, institution is a nightmare. I have a huge like, stack of hard drives which are failing, um, and I don't know also which data is on which drive, so I thought it would be really nice if you can just search for it somewhere that on a, some, some kind of reliable service. And the reason, and of course there are again many uh, repositories as we have mentioned, uh, been like yesterday, like the Nodo Fixture, OSF, and the reason why I thought that the, we could really benefit from a specialized repository is because we could have a customized and detailed metadata which will kind of uh, improve searchability and findability. Maybe we can curate this a little bit better. We can maybe create better documentation uh, in this way. We can maybe also think about new ways to analyze and visualize things and maybe we can get some new insights. Maybe we can even develop new methods because we'll have more data. And essentially, it's all about having like better and more accessible science. So people can also, other people can look at your data. <coughs> and we can learn. Like if we must make mistakes, uh, then we can learn from that. But if we don't really share things, and if we don't really report how we do things, then we don't know actually where are we making those mistakes. And we are all making mistakes all the time, which now I will kind of show you the, uh, what the next part of my talk. And essentially, I was kind of interested how can I actually turn this data into knowledge? Because knowledge is more important than data is just the way to get there, I guess. And now, I would like to give you like a quick overview of my career path, expressing methods. So I started with the QM on, on some small systems on Enzyme. I did QMM and then on these small systems to kind of validate like if QMM works, like uh, if, if these parameters are working compared to like uh, benchmark uh, couple cluster uh, uh, level of theory. And then I moved to MD again because I was working on enzymes, so you have to like, have this multi scale uh, approach to characterize all the, I, I guess, important aspects of, uh, of enzyme function. Of course, I started immediately with free energy calculation because that's the best way to enter in molecular dynamic simulations. We got very frustrated, but I did some kind of free energy perturbation and thermodynamic integration to kind of check a uh, difference in binding energy between like uh, between a substrate and the inhibitor <coughs> and then i got to sign this just like a little side project like it will just uh, uh it will be just like a little thing we will help these uh, experimentalists in munich um you i would just do like this quick qmmm study of the mechanism of this uh photoenzyme which does like dna repair so they are like excited states all sorts of fun stuff and I was like, yeah, okay, well, let's give it a try because there are like several proposed mechanisms. They weren't really sure what's happening. I never got to the QMM part. I mean, I did, but not in a mechanistic way. So essentially, I got stuck at the first step because there were two histidines in the active site. And we didn't know what, are, what were the protonation states. So there are essentially nine possible combinations, even just to run MDs, because you need to assign protonation states in advance. There are no proton jumpings around, right? So I spent a year doing this. And then I did MD, I did QM and <coughs> compare a lot to actually calculate some EPI parameters to compare with the experiment. I did Fasson Boltzmann to calculate PKAs. I used all the available servers to calculate and estimate PKAs. 
um, and they give you very varying results. Um, and essentially, with Poisson Boltzmann, if you know how to choose your parameters, you can get the answer that you want out of it. Um, and then finally, I went back to my original project. I did more molecular dynamics, but this, not, this time now, umbrella sampling and steered molecular dynamics because non equilibrium free energy is uh, amazing, but so hard to work with. And it's really <coughs> impossible for this system that I was working on because I was, I was trying to get the free energy of the entry of coenzyme A, which in itself is a very long molecule and has so many degrees of freedom. And I was destined to fail, but I didn't really know that. And then finally I went to postdoc and I started to work on membrane proteins, which are completely different. These very complicated just because of their size, and I will also explain why in the, in the, in the, in the next uh, few slides. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, yeah. you got to rock bottom and satisfaction yes, when you reached the membrane. <laughs> None of my projects really worked. Every now and then you need some kind of a boost to, to kind of like get you going. And, but everything was everything that I tried to do, they were all just like more problems, more problems. So maybe just my perspective and I see problems, I'll just like, oh yeah, another interesting problem. And I was like, no, like this, I have to do this. I thought it would be easier. But then this is also the point where I started working on membrane proteins. I really started to feel the need. I really wanted to see other people's data. Because I started to work on a protein where there was like a lot of contradictory information, even in the experiments, and not to mention uh, simulations. So I didn't really know who to trust, and I didn't know what, what data was actually reliable. I mean, it would all seemed okay, but it's, it was all slightly different. Again, you could make data complex whatever you want, but I think in this case. And that's how I started to think about this, about uh, data repository, that's how MDBox was born. And I started to really enjoy that. Like I had so much fun doing uh, uh, MDBox. Uh, I, it, again, it's just a prototype, but I learned really a lot. I got really super interested in, in the infrastructure and everything surrounding it, um, including money. And then that's how I also ended up uh, looking for decentralized solutions. And I think, and I also really, really enjoyed that. And th I think that's a really uh, interesting and exciting. Uh, there are some new and exciting developments in that area. And it's really worth, I think, uh, keeping an eye on it. So definitely my satisfaction uh, rises, so I guess uh, unaffiliation and being unemployed is not that bad, although there's a lot of probably negative connotations with the words. But like, so I'll, and then in the meantime, these are like the m main packages that I use. I use Gaussian, but I also use like a bunch of others, but these are like the, that I use on a daily basis. And I use Ember with Ember Force Field. I use mostly a PBS for Poisson Boltzmann. But when I went to Pozog, I switched to Bromox and Bromox Forest Field. I also then at some point tried to use Amber again after three or four years break. I had to, I had to relearn re how to use Amber because it has changed so much in the meantime. But what I did I actually uh, did use so many different analysis tools. I'll explain again why that I, uh, that was like, again, that's like I think probably the biggest. Um, gain from my pose of just like trying all these different protein analysis. I think I have probably tried every possible protein analysis that there is to uh, make sense of the data that I was given. So, meet my arch enemy, which is P-glycoprotein, and it's an ABC transporter. It's a multi-drug transporter. It has like more than 100 substrates, and it's very slow. So you wonder, why would you even model this? And it's uh, very large. It has like 1,300 residues. It, um, so this is the structure, but there's also a linker, which is, which is missing from the crystal structure. It's 60 residues long. Crystal structures are between 3.8 and 4.2 angstroms, and there are more than 15 different crystal structures of mouse uh, P-glycoprotein currently in the PVD. And so, and this is roughly the mechanism, so there are like really big conformational changes in all. So you have ATP binding, to make things a little more complicated, to two nuclear binding domains, which brings them close together, and that's how somehow supposed to drive conformation change. With that, the drug is being here in this uh, cavity, and then the drug kind of gets uh, uh, expelled from the. So it's a drug pump, essentially. It gets kicked out of the, of the cell, and you repeat the cycle. This cycle, I think, it's on a second uh, time scale. So. When I, when I arrived to, to work, uh, uh, so when I arrived and I started to work on this protein, I, I browsed the literature. I, every, every, every time when I would read another paper, I would get more and more confused. 
Uh, so at some point I just decided like I'll just look at all just the structural data and I, I'll stick with that. And the interesting thing with PGP, just at, the, at that time, uh, there were like two identical, I mean, not two identical, two structures that were derived from identical crystallographic data. So two different structures, or, or two different solutions from the same uh, diffraction data. And these are, I'll call them for simplicity, blue, <coughs> orange, and green, so I, I think it's easier than using PDB codes. So essentially blue and orange, are derived from the same uh, crystallographic data, but because they were sold in a slightly different way, I won't get into the details, there were like some changes in the in the helices. So there were like the registry shift in multiple of helices, which actually changes like which residues are actually water exposed and which residues are membrane exposed and so on. Both again at the same resolution. So the question is like which one will you use for your simulations? And of course at that time most of the simulations in the literature were the original orange structure. And then there was, uh, again, the green structure came out at roughly the same, again, at this, exactly the same resolution, but it had wider separation between these nucleotide binding, binding domains. So is this like a, another confirmation? Like a, and again, all the experimental data reported that you can have like a really a large motion between, um, between these domains. So I used Bromos, I mean Bromax with Bromos, I used Bromax 333, which was so slow, I was getting two nanoseconds per day, but I persisted, so I got to 200 at some point. And it, of course, like, they were like, I had to learn how to set up a membrane system, so it was all, it would be like a little bit slower uh, than usually. I also wanted initially com to compare this blue structure to the orange, like to my supervisor data, but then I actually set it up uh, by myself and rerun it again to make things even like more like similar to each other. But these are just like pairwise arguments, D plots, and what this is like for the entire protein. This is just for transmembrane domain, and this is like going up to 1.8 <laughs> nanometers, which is really large. So essentially, the difference between structures was up to 20 angstroms in terms of RMSD. So the, the difference was really big. All the simulations, they were all started from the same point, but they all diverged, essentially. Except for the transmembrane domain, so this is PCA analysis. You can see that they are all scattered in the PC space, but what these here are a little bit lumped. And this one, which is again the blue structure, is probably the, the, the the one that changes the least in, in, in this area. So the blue structure is actually, let's call it, stable. Um, so these are like the snapshots. You can see that like, uh, they, these are just representative clusters of the simulation. And this is like the helical content. So you can see that actually that the, the protein is unfolding as you simulate it. And like all the, like this is just like one set of variables that you can uh, analyze, but none of it is converged, everything changes. Uh, and obviously I'm under-resampling because this is 200 nanoseconds and the, the, the entire protein was on the a, on a second uh, time scale. But this, these were the longest simulations. Everything was like between 50 and 100 at that time. And people were reporting all sorts of findings, claiming all sorts of mechanistic insights, but the, the problem is you can't do that at all. And then this unfolding was uh, uh, interpreted as dynamics and flexibility, but we don't really know if it's this <coughs> flexibility because the crystal structures were bad, or maybe the, I mean, the protein is definitely dynamic, but what is dynamics and what's, uh, what's actually unfolding, we can't really say. So I worked for this and I'm trying to analyze, and when you only get this noise and things falling apart, like what kind of story is it? Like nobody's really interesting to hear, like, oh, but your simulation is <coughs> falling apart, hence it's not working. So when we first submitted this, I got a review saying, your simulations diverged. And I was like, yes, that's what I'm trying to say. So that was like a, a, a feedback. And that the work is not novel. So I think this is really wrong way of looking at this type of work. And I'm not, these, these are just vanilla simulations. This is not even enhanced dampening. This is like just the most basic thing you can do with a membrane protein. And then last year we had a student and I asked her to do something that was kind of, uh, I was really interested in, I got interested in like after a while and then you hear the frustration. So I actually asked her like to use all the available force field in Gromax to see what are we getting out of it. So uh, do we get unfolding of the helices if we use the in different force field? Do we get this uh, clumping of uh, transmembrane domains? And so these are like RMSDs of each particular um, of every uh, 
nucleotide binding domains and transmembrane domains. And you can see that it, it, it varies. Like, again, it's not really <coughs> averaged in any, in any way. This is a PCA analysis in the hydro and the Cartesian space. And again, all the simulations are pretty much all over the place. And here are distances between nuclear binding domains. So we try to kind of pull out some experimental data. So there are some deer and FRED experiments which also had to be taken with care. But again, you can see the distribution distances from all these different force fields are different. So if you choose OPLS, you would get, I don't know which color is OPLS, it's purple. So for example, you would be here. But for example, if I wanted to use Gromos, which I did, then I would be here. And then the green one is Martini, which actually gave the best result, but only after the simulations were ex extended to a, a microsecond time scale. And then amber is here. Essentially, you don't know what you're getting because we always choose just one force field. And if you would get, choose another one, you would get a bunch of different results. I apologize for the quality of the pictures, but I took them from a PDF because I didn't plan to talk about this. So I had to scavenge from a, a thesis. Um, so uh, yeah, this is, it, this is essentially what I, I, what I wanted to say. So, it's really hard to spell MD with, with, uh, with the experiment. We often don't have the experimental data that is comparable to MD. We are still mostly undersampling, definitely for the transmembrane proteins because they are so large and usually quite slow. So I think we probably need to also set up some standards like how much can we say about these simulations without like over interpreting? If we have like 100 nanoseconds, can we really make bold claims about mechanism? I think maybe sometimes, but that would be I think those would be rare cases. And again, I made all of my data available uh, when I published uh, uh, this paper. I put it on Figshare. I made all the input. Uh, but I, I, I had to make a selection of what do I want to put out there. And to be honest, I also cut some corners there because it was easier. I was in a hurry. I had like, uh, lots of things to do. So I didn't put everything that I think should be up there. But I tried to provide all the input class, the initial and final coordinates. I put trajectories, I stripped water because uh, they would be too big to upload. I had parameter files, DPR, so I think things that could be useful and some, some analysis stuff as well. And then I did a drag and drop on Figshare. The problem is I did it several times as I was changing the manuscript, as I was remembering, oh, maybe I should put this as well, maybe I should add that, as you know how the process of writing the paper goes. Um, but some of my files were actually missing. I went recently to just to check something, and then I realized that, well, actually, where is this file? I thought that I had put it up there. And the reason is what I did, I did a drag and drop, and I left it to upload because it was really, like, the, the, the upload was really, really slow. So these, these weren't even like such huge files. I think it was like a few gigabytes or something, so it wasn't some impossible size, but it was slow to upload. And I think probably at some point, because I left this window to upload and I went to do something else, uh, I did check, but there was like, I think there's like 60 files on it also. I, I mean, I'm, it's easy to miss if you don't. So we definitely, I want to say, we need some kind of flag making. If, if we decide on what, what are like some standard or really required files that you can't upload until you have like check, check, you need to think this, 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 and this, because we can't really rely that we will notice everything again uh, about it. And I also just forgot to include some other things that might be useful because I was busy uh, uh, with other things and I wanted to get it done and I wanted to like, get rid of this paper and move on with my life. And I also want to say like my, my simulations were like one, probably one year in fiction before I published the paper. I did not get school. Um, so uh, I don't think there is a reason for fear to that. But so I like these were like really some basic simulations, like nothing fancy about them at all, except that there, there, there is a membrane in them. But just in setting up the system and how we do things and how we run simulations, so I decided to roughly cluster like where do we introduce some errors, or not errors, but where do we introduce different presentations, or whatever you want to call it, which might affect this reproducibility. So it's every time we need to make a decision. And I'll start, I, I, this is like my rough clustering of, uh, of uh, um, different uh, sources of uh, divergence or whatever you want to call it again. So there is theoretical one. So we need to choose a force field. So you need to choose like a physical model to describe your data. 
you need to choose a sampling method. Will it be vanilla simulation? Will it be enhanced sampling? If you do enhanced sampling, which enhanced sampling? If you do, you have to choose reaction coordinate, which reaction coordinate? How you will choose that? So on and so forth. Then we analyze data, then you have to unbias your simulation, you have to do all sorts of steps. Again, you need to choose what you need to do, whether you want to use the available tools, do you want to write your wrongs, do you want to use MD analysis or MD triage or, or Romex, like it doesn't really matter. And then again, there is like computational, I don't want to even go there, but there's hardware, so you can use CPUs, GPUs, their architecture, all sorts of things that are affecting the end, like precision and, and we know about this and there's not really much we can do, so I don't really want to um, go uh, too much in there. But there's also software, like which package will you, will you use? Which version of that package will you use? Are you going to write your own code? Will you share that code? So there are like, all sorts of things that, again, affect the results. And then there's like, all this practical, where actually we are setting up the system. That means topology building, which protonation states, so the, which ions do you want to put in? Um, which water model do we do want to use? Uh, initial coordinates, which PDB will you choose? Will you try to build something by yourself? If you are building some kind of polymer, again, what, 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 what will you choose as, as, a, as a starting point? Because starting points are really important. And then relaxation. I call this relaxation because other people do like, refer to this like equilibration as well. But how do you, when you minimize things, like do you heat it up? Do you put position restraints? All sorts of decisions that are included here. In, in here. Um, and then again, production parameters, which thermostat, which barostat, which uh, electrostatic method, uh, how many simulations do you <coughs> want to run, how long, all of this kind of affects this reproducibility. And essentially, all these perturbation flows, I think we call it workflow. So all these things, when we make the decision, that's a workflow, right? And now, I would, before we continue, I would like to introduce the R words. So, I think before we break out into the discussion, we should maybe really talk about what reproducibility really means and what does it mean for us, because I think it probably also varies between the fields. And there is actually a lot of discussion about reproducibility, and so this is not discussion for, uh, this is not definition for repeatability, replicability, and reproducibility, and people make the difference between uh, these three. Um, uh, terms, but they are often in language used interchangeably. So repeatability means same thing, same experimental setup. Essentially replicas, when you start maybe from the same uh, uh, point, using running it on, your, uh, uh, on the same machine, uh, set it up or, and set up in exactly the same way. Different things, same ex experiment, so replica uh, replicability, different things, same experimental setup. Essentially someone is uh, using your machine, your devices, but someone else is doing it, and reproducibility means a completely different environment uh, and different experimental setup. They can follow your protocol, but in, the, in a way, everything is different, including machines, equipment, uh, and people working on the experiment. Additionally, some people kind of introduced research reproducibility definition, which is method reproducibility. That means provide sufficient detail about procedures and data so that the same procedure could be exactly repeated. Results reproducibility, obtain the same results from an independent study with procedures as closely matched to the original study as possible. And then there's this inferential reproducibility, draw the same conclusions from either an independent replication of a study or, or reanalysis of the original study. So which definition do we choose actually when we discuss these things? Um, I think that's really important so we are all, all on the same page so that we are all trying to provide this solution for the same problem rather than the people thinking about different steps and we have seen that there are like really many steps in terms of thinking of reproducibility. And I guess the question is like, what do we really want? Is reproducibility really important for MD? Like how would we achieve it? What do we mean by it? And yesterday we discussed quality of simulation. What do we mean by quality? Is it, is it Am I making better simulations than, I don't know, someone else? Are my simulations of better quality? Is it, uh, I don't know, like how do you find quality? Like how long do you run it? Is like which force field do you use? I mean, it's, um, I think it's a really tough question to answer. Maybe not even going to one worthwhile answer. But I think what is worthwhile answering, like what is really important to push and be forward? Like what is it that we really care about? And what can really make this method more usable in the end? So. 
I think rather than reproducibility, I'll focus on another hour that, that's reliability. So we have like really good best practices. So if you follow this, if you want to do, if you want to calculate violent free energies, for example, there should be probably good, like not necessarily perfect, but maybe this is like the best way to achieve like the highest accuracy and so forth. We can <coughs> give each other recipes and best practices and how to check out that things are actually good. We should also maybe focus on accuracy, so make sure that our force fields are performing well, which means we should maybe do some more benchmarking studies, which maybe means that we should team up with some um, experimentalists who could actually derive data sets that are really comparable to MD. Maybe we can really try to work on that to have these benchmarking sets, because we don't have them at the moment. We have some, but I don't think enough. And we can also do relative comparisons sometimes. It, but these are like studies that kind of burn computer time, and it doesn't bring you that novel, uh, um, uh, those novel results that get you published in Nature's. And finally, like how do we, what, which metrics do we want to use, and how do we validate that what we thought is actually useful? And for this, I think really the nicest thing that I have seen recently is the Living Journal of Molecular Sciences and their best practices in terms of. Uh, Error, error bars and uh, uh, error calculations. That's like I I was trying to learn also the, that's exactly the same thing, but it took me very long time because I was searching for this literature all over the place. So I think we really need to start consolidating things that we have learned maybe in the past 10 years and make it more available and accessible to people who are coming so they don't also have to spend like months trying to understand how to calculate error bars and things. And I think uh, Eric's message from breakfast is aim low, don't aim too high, let's get at least something done.